Hi, this is Jonathan Busco. Welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss the chest and abdominal exam. By the end of this session, you'll be able to perform a physical exam of both the chest and the abdomen, including inspection, palpation, and auscultation, and in the case of the abdomen, percussion. So again, we're not doing surgery shipboard. And so your exam is entirely based on what you see on the outside. So looking at the abdomen from the anterior, you can see where it's labeled. But remember, again, depending on where the patient is in their respiratory cycle, the diaphragm moves almost as high as the nipple line and almost as low as the umbilicus anteriorly, so almost as low as the belly button. And so your diaphragm can actually essentially move that distance and change its position. You also need to remember what organs are where, and you'll need to review that on your own uh, because, again, that will help you in your exam, particularly in trauma. When we look at the posterior, we don't think of it really as the posterior abdomen. We think of it as the flanks and the back. But your abdomen is essentially the top of the pelvic brim, where the hips come into the angle of the hourglass and up to the bottom of the rib cage. And so posterior pain or posterior injuries can also reflect some intra-abdominal pathologic process. So generally speaking, for any structure, but particularly for the thoracoabdominal cavity, we do these three physical exam techniques at a minimum. We inspect, which means that we look, we use our eyes. We palpate, which means we feel, and we auscultate, which means we listen, and typically that means we listen with a stethoscope. So when you do your physical exam of the chest, you start by inspecting. You look at the general appearance. Does this appear to be a normal appearing chest? And if there are any abnormalities, do they look like this is some acute abnormality, something that's just happened, or something chronic? So, if, for example, someone with uh, pectus excavatum, it's something that kids are born with and adults grow up with it. It looks like there's a divot in the center of the chest, a small cup almost, where it looks like the breastbone is pushed in. That's something they've had their whole life. It's probably not contributing to what's going on now. On the other hand, patients with Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease can have what is called a barrel chest, which looks like a big round barrel. That's a chronic change, but if they're having trouble breathing now, it probably relates. You want to look at the chest and make sure it's moving. Is it expanding? And does it look like it's expanding symmetrically to you? Once you're sure it's moving and it's moving symmetrically, look side to side. Are the actual sides of the chest wall symmetric? Or does one side look different than the other, and which one looks normal and which doesn't? And again, does this look like something acute or something chronic? Is there any evidence of any injury? And does this look like a recent injury, or is this old scarring? For example, a surgical scar. Is there any discoloration or rashes? Someone's complaining of chest pain. It's a burning pain on the left side of their chest. You take off their shirt, and you see a thin line, a red stripe, in the transverse plane on their chest that goes to the midline but doesn't cross the midline and is covered with small fluid filled blisters. The patient has shingles. You have your answer. So you look for discoloration and rashes. Then you look for retractions which is where the skin is pulling in between the ribs and that's the patient breathing so hard in so much respiratory distress they're using the muscles between the ribs the intercostal muscles to help them breathe and so it looks like the skin is pulling in and that's a sign of significant respiratory distress. You then want to feel the chest. You want to feel for any deformity and see if it feels asymmetric. Uh, does it feel like there's an acute deformity? Is something that just happened? Or is it chronic? Is it side to side? Or is it on one side only? You want to feel movement. And so you put your hands on their chest, palms down against the chest, and your fingers pointing up towards their head and your thumbs together at the midline right over the sternum of the breastbone. And when they take a breath, your thumbs should move apart an equal distance in both directions. So that shows you symmetry of movement of the chest. 
You want to palpate the chest for tenderness, and if you found deformity earlier, try to correlate that deformity with tenderness. Then you want to feel for crepitus. Now, crepitus can be the grinding of two bone ends pushing together. So in a broken bone, you get crepitus where the bone ends grind together. That's one type of crepitus. It's a fairly distinct feeling. With chest injuries, you can get another type of crepitus. And that is from air being released from the lung into the chest wall and into the soft tissues of the chest with an injury. And so you're actually feeling air bubbles popping in the skin. What does this feel like? Well, if you take a breakfast cereal like Rice Krispies or some other crispy air-filled breakfast cereal and you put it between some layers of saran wrap or between the two edges of a napkin and you push down on it, that popping feeling you feel under your fingers, that's the feeling of crepitus. And you should everybody should try that because that's a very distinct feeling. And when you feel it on someone's chest, you know they have a lung injury, you know they've ruptured their lung, you know that air is escaping into the chest. You don't need a chest x-ray to confirm that. You have your diagnosis. There's no other way to do that. Then you auscultate, you listen, and you're listening for air movement you're listening through air movement throughout the chest. You want to know if it's symmetric on both sides, or are you hearing none on one side, some on the other, abnormal sounds on one side, no abnormal sounds on the other, or abnormal sounds in one part of the lung, but nowhere else. And then you need to be able to identify the abnormal sounds. How competent you are on this depends on how much training you've had. So if you feel comfortable, you know the major abnormal sounds, wheezes, a high-pitched musical sound, rails, a crackling sound like what you would hear if you grabbed the hair right by your ear and just rubbed it between your thumb and your index finger. You just hear that kind of crackling sound and ronchi, which is sort of a rumbling sound. If you're comfortable that you can differentiate between those, describe those. Otherwise, just say, I heard something strange. With the abdomen, we inspect, again, the general appearance. What does the abdomen look like? It is a normal-looking abdomen. Is it protuberant? Is it round? Does it look tight or tense, like there's a ball stuck in there? Is there any evidence of injury? Do you see discoloration or rash? And what are the contours? Does it look symmetric on both sides, or are you seeing things protruding out in one area that you're not seeing somewhere else? Now, because palpation can actually get the bowel going a little bit, we auscultate second. So we inspect, then we auscultate the abdomen. And we're listening for bowel sounds. And if you listen, you need to listen for up to a minute and describe them as either present or absent. There are other descriptors that we use, uh, high-pitched, tinkling, rumbling, um, etc. But for your purposes, either they're there or they're not. And you listen for one minute. Does it really matter where you listen? No, but you're most likely to hear good bowel sounds in the sort of mid-epigastrum to belly button area um, or on to the right of that. Uh, you can hear them just about anywhere, and we do listen in all four quadrants, or you can, but really if that's the area where I'm going to listen w one time and I'm going to listen for a minute to see if they're there, that's where I'm going to listen. And then we palpate. And we're palpating for tenderness. So does it hurt where I push? We're palpating for masses. And not only are we trying to feel masses, but then we need to describe them as either having a pulse or not. A pulsatile mass in the midline of the abdomen is very concerning for something called an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is where the aorta, the big blood vessel, balloons out. And if it's pulsatile, and it's tender, and the patient has a lot of abdominal pain, particularly if it's going to the back or down into the uh, femoral creases, the area where the legs join the body. If they're having those symptoms, then they probably have a rupturing a, uh, AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm, and they need surgery immediately. And then you check what's called percussion tenderness. So you've palpated to find areas of tenderness, but if you think about playing a drum, tapping a drum. If you take your index finger or your middle finger of your non-dominant hand and you just lay those fingers right on the abdomen. You pick a spot and you're going to palpate, you're going to do this as percussion tenderness all over the abdomen. 
but you just start in one spot. Then take the index and the middle finger of your other hand and tap on the non-dominant hand, those fingers that are on the abdomen. You're percussing, you're tapping on there, and that tells you very locally if there's any peritonitis, inflammation of the lining of the abdominal wall. So it lets you really localize where that's at. Another way to test for peritonitis is to have the patient either hold their legs out straight with their knees locked while they're laying on their back and then you hit the heel of their foot. Or what I like to do is I like to have them stand up on one foot and hop. And if that doesn't make their abdominal pain worse, then they don't have peritonitis. They don't have inflammation of the abdominal wall cavity lining. If it does make it worse, then you do more percussion tenderness and try to localize it and sort it out. But that's an additional technique we use when we examine the abdomen. You can percuss the chest. You can percuss other areas as well. But we think of it mostly as an, an exam technique for the abdomen. Please complete any associated knowledge assessments, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your instructor or professor. Thank you very much.